speaking to you this morning from the book of Kings, please. 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relation to the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan of camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold, and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your men must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he's made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. The Queen of Sheba was an honest inquirer. She was not content with the reports that she had heard in her own land. It seemed to her that it was impossible, it just seemed impossible, that a man of such fame, such riches, could also be the wisest man on earth. He was the wisest man on earth at that time. As far as I know, there's only been one wiser man than Solomon. That's Jesus Christ. Now, she had questions. She had questions to ask for herself that no one else could ask. I'm here to tell you this morning, there's no one else that can ask your questions for you. Because you see, you won't get a proper response. Oh, the substance of a question can be the same, but the tone, the spirit, and the quality will differ in some way. And so the inquiry is never the same. It's never the same. As a matter of fact, the answer is never the same. The tone, the spirit, you never really get the true answer if you, unless you hear the tone and the spirit and the anointing of the man. So the Queen of Sheba was a model inquirer. And so she said, I will go myself and state my case and see this man face to face. Well, I want you to know that most people chose to stay home. They were content to hear, just simply hear about Solomon. But this woman was not just content to hear about Solomon. She wanted to come and hear. She wanted to come and see. She wanted to see for herself. She said, this is too great. I mean, this is, this is so marvelous. This is so fantastic. Surely, surely this is not true. Or surely it's not false. Either way, she had to go and find out for herself. Oh my, it's a great thing to come to God's house and really see, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, it's a great thing when you're sharing with someone and say, listen, I've got to come and see this. I've got to come and hear this. I've got to come and find out for myself. This is so marvelous. This information is so tremendous. I want to go for myself. I want to sense. I want to hear. I want to feel. I want to touch. I want to see what's behind this thing. She traveled. As she traveled, her heart was 
full of hope that at last she would receive solutions to problems which had filled her with such a spirit of unrest. Can you imagine? How wonderful. If you can remember back when you first began to get some information that somewhere along the way you could receive some help from God. I mean, that God was actually alive. And he, he had the answer to your every problem and every need. And, and he knew the way and no one else did. And his, his mind was so great that he knew everything. And he could lift that old heavy burden off of you. Well, if you take time to go back and review, I believe you'd be rather encouraged. Say, oh, I remember when I first began to get reports that there was help for me. There was hope for me in this life. That God actually was real. That, that you know, he, he wasn't just, uh, just visiting a congregation on Sunday morning and didn't, didn't, live, didn't live from Sunday morning to Wednesday night. He took a little vacation. Well, we've given people that idea because that's the way most church people live. They act as if God's dead between Sunday morning and Wednesday. But oh, how encouraged she must have been knowing that here was the wisest man on earth, knowing that he had the answer to every solution and every problem. Every problem he had a solution for. Everything that came up, he could always give the answer. It's because he was in contact with the one that had all the answers. And so she made it uncomfortable for herself. She made it uncomfortable for herself. She troubled herself for own, her own spiritual benefit, for her own spiritual welfare. Now, she didn't have to do this. She didn't have to live her, leave her riches, her fame behind. She didn't have to leave the throne where she was. She lived in luxury. She was an extremely wealthy woman. But I want you to know she made it uncomfortable for herself to travel through long hours and, and many, many days and, and uh, times of, of uh, you know, being very thirsty and, and being very hot and, and uh, uncomfortable. She, she troubled herself about this thing. Been easier to stay at home after all. It's a lot easier for us to stay home in the air-conditioned home watching television than it is to trouble ourselves about going to church when we've heard, hey, but God's grace, you can get help over there. Hey, there's a man in the land. Praise God, God sent him here. He's got solutions to, to, to problems, to difficulties. God's helping him and anointing him to help us to know how to do God's will. But I want you to know we'll have to trouble ourselves to get there. We'll have to make ourselves uncomfortable. It's a lot easier to stay home when we live very far away from the church. Can you see that? Well, it's a lot easier in our day to stay home than even it was in Queen Sheba's day. I want you to know she lived a far distance. She had to travel many, many miles and, and weeks and weeks to get to see King Solomon. She didn't have air conditioning in the, in the wagon. She didn't have, uh, you know, a prepared tables set for her all the time. Well, I'll tell you, they had to do some camping out. They, they had to go through some difficult problems and situations to ever arrive there. But oh, thank God she pressed through. Yeah. It's a lot easier for us to stay home and say, you know, I've got a headache this morning. My back's aching a little bit. I just think I'll stay home. After all, it's so comfortable here. How many times have I told you that the more you have, the harder, harder it will be to do God's will. You got a nice, soft, comfortable sofa to sit on in an air-conditioned room. A pretty good-sized television set. And a little something in the refrigerator. And a sweet, dear companion that loves you so much. It's so easy to stay home. So she troubled herself but it was for her spiritual welfare. Therefore, she became a prepared listener. 
She became a prepared listener. Her heart was ready. Her heart was open. Her heart was honest. Her heart was desirous to know, was really, truly wanting to know the solutions to life. She became a prepared listener. You see, people who do not, do not trouble themselves in order to inquire into spiritual matters are not really in a fit position to receive communications from heaven. They're not really ready. They'll come. They'll judge. They'll find fault. They'll, they'll see certain negative things. They'll find, they'll, they'll be bitter. They'll, they'll get full of resentment toward, toward little things. I'll tell you, if a soul has really troubled himself, I mean, if he's really made himself uncomfortable, really, really denied himself to get where God wants him to be, I want you to know he's going to be a prepared listener. Oh, he's going to be ready to hear the truth, willing to hear what God has for him or her. We must not be male receivers of the word, but suppliants intensely interested in the word of wisdom coming from the throne of grace. You see, God should see us in a waiting posture, knowing that we're tarrying before him until light comes in the darkness. Oh, he wants to see that soul that's waiting to hear the good news. The Bible tells us that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He'll do everything he can to get to us. But if we refuse, if we refuse and rebel, God didn't fail. We simply fail to respond to him. I believe there would be more Solomons if there were more inquirers like Sheba. There would be greater preachers if there were greater hearers. For we need a revival in the pew. The average prisoner will listen to a thousand voices all at once and therefore not listening to anyone. They're clamoring to hear this over there, clamoring to hear this, clamoring to get after that preacher, clamoring to go to that place, clamoring for this place. Oh my, if they were willing, if they were willing to get where God wants them, where God's calling them, where God's bidding them to come, come and see. Oh, I tell you, it'd be a different story today. But because we're trying to be, we're trying to get so much information from so many. We wind up not listening generally. We don't listen usually to the one that God really sends to us. To be here requires intensity of attention. Consciousness of deep spiritual necessity and should demand that the response be given under a baptism of fire. I'd hate to go and hear a preacher that spoke in a monotone that didn't care whether you got this in your heart or not. Brother, I'll tell you, I want to hear someone that believes, that knows what what he has is real and true, and it demands a baptism of fire. How many places you've been and think, oh, Lord, this puts me to sleep. Brother, if a man's going to talk as if he he doesn't really... I believe it's just going to... Rock you to sleep. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I believe it demands. If you've got the kind of heart that really hears, wants to hear, desires to hear, longs to hear, I believe it demands that a man be under a baptism of fire to give you the information that you need from the throne of grace. Praise God. My brother Wood said to me, you know, I've been on a stage with you for almost 14 years. He's, he's not six feet away from me most of the time. And he said, I just found out that I'm not hearing you. I thought I was, but I just found out that I'm not really hearing my own pastor. We just started taping, you know, recently our, our services purchased a few of the tapes. He said, oh, I'm amazed. I am amazed. I thought I heard you. I did not hear you. I did not hear the things you were saying. He said, if I were to preach an hour and a half, he was almost sure that he would not hear a third of it. 
See, when I go back and I review these sermons and I play them back, pastor, he said, I thought I was hearing, but I found out that I was not hearing. That's the reason Jesus kept saying, if a man have an ear, let him hear. Let him hear. If a man have an ear, he's talking about the ear of the heart, the ear of the soul. If a man have an ear, oh, we hear these things in our ears. They're going into your ears right now. But are we hearing? Is it registering, registering with us? We only hear as much as we've obeyed for. And if we've not obeyed God and done God's will, then we're not hearing very much. But if he's like that and he's only six feet from me, then I wonder, I wonder about you that are a little bit farther away and you that didn't press to get close to the front. I wonder, I wonder how much are we really hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Phil said to me, Pastor, I'm listening to your tapes. He said, I, I'm amazed. He said, he said, I really believe I'm, I'm missing it. I believe most of us are missing what you really say. He said, I did, I did, I've missed it. I've missed it. I thought I heard. I did not hear. I had to go back and review and play it over and over and go back and review. And he said, I, I believe when I go back and review, I might hear a little bit. I'm, I'm hearing a little bit. I'm picking up a few things, a lot of things I missed. But some of, said, some of the things you say, he said, you go right through them and we don't even hear them. We don't even hear them unless you go back and labor on a point, labor on it and work at it, you know. He said, we miss the little things that just come. They slip out of you. We miss those things. The Queen of Sheba represented the common desire of man to find someone in whom she could trust to ask the most troubling and perplexing questions, even those things which were closest to her heart. Verse 2 said she communed with him of all that was in her heart. She communed with him of all that was in her heart. Well, how could he answer such questions so freely? I'll tell you why. Because she had already half answered them by opening her own heart and communing with him. And so when he spoke, he simply sowed the seed on prepared Soil. Oh. oh, how much difference it makes to a minister mm -hmm. when someone comes to him and they're honest. I mean, really honest. And they really mean business. How much more wonderful. Oh, I've had people come to me that were determined they were not going to hear me. They were determined they were not going to hear me. And I'd have to work and 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 try to share with them to be encouraged. They were determined they wanted to be discouraged. They were determined they wanted to live in a self-life. They were determined they wanted to sin forever and never find Jesus Christ. They were determined. They were rebellious against God and did not want to hear what I had to say. I've had people bring me people like that. I thought, oh, please, don't, don't bring people like that. Bring someone that's honest. Bring there are many thousands and yea millions that are that are honest and and desire to hear the truth and long to hear the truth. They want to know the way. They are open to the way. Yes, yes. And so when he spoke, he was he was sowing the seed on prepared soil. He felt that he was in vital communication with a living soul, a listener who heard not only every word, but every tone. And she seemed to know the spiritual value of every word. Well, she came with questions, but she came with love. She came with a heart of faith. She came with a heart that was giving. She brought many fine things. But the Bible says she brought 120 talents of gold. Now, how much is it? That's, a, that's about four and a half tons of gold. Now, how many camels do you think it required just to carry the gold? Now, that probably would be a lot of camels. Just to carry the gold. What? She came with a heart full of love. She came with a heart of expectancy. She came bearing gifts. Brother, she sensed, she sensed that there was, there was greatness here. She heard there was greatness. She sensed there was greatness. And she had prepared to come and honor greatness. You know, if you suspect greatness, you need to be prepared to honor greatness. Brother, she suspected it. She had heard about it. So she came with a heart full of expectancy. She expected to honor one that was greater 
than she was. Come with a trusting heart. Come with a loving heart. Come with a heart bearing gifts of respect and honor. Why, the least you could do is be a respectable person. Be an honorable person. And listen. And have a heart of openness and thankfulness. Someone asked Jesus questions, you know. The Bible would has said, spoken. It said that Jesus answered them not a word. He looked down. But if a hearer will tell the speaker all that's within his or her heart, I want you to know that Christ will draw near to you and reveal himself. Where do you hide your heart? We're hiding. We're men and women in hiding. We're not honest. I want you to know if you're honest before God, God will draw near to you. Betty knew she was a sinner. She knew she was lost and undone and away from God. She had given up all hope of ever knowing Jesus again. In drugs. In drugs so deep that from morning to night she didn't want to see the light of day. One of the shades spoke. Did not want anyone to call. Did not want anyone to come by. Wanted to hide. Get away. And I pray, Jesus, Lord, can I go back? Can I call her? Can, could I somehow, could I have a conference with her? Oh, Lord, I would... And every time the Lord had helped me know, I couldn't do it. And I waited five years. I think it was almost five years from the time Betty left our church. Deep drugs. Probably most any drug you can name. God help me to wait and pray. Some of you were praying with us. But then one day, God did a marvelous thing. Amen. And you know, there comes a time when man must die, but there also are times when some die that others may live. If I know anything, I know that when men die, that some come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. God works through sorrow. God works in funerals. God works through death. And so that afternoon, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me I'd be seeing Betty that night. He said, son, I want you to give her a message for me. If somehow you can get over to her, then I really love her. Then I really care. Then I know where she is. Then I know how she feels. I sure would appreciate it. He said, Lord, by your grace. And then he told me, he gave me the steps. He said, I'll, I t he said, I'll share with you three things to tell her. He told me three things to tell Betty. I see, this was a very unusual thing. I waited five years for this girl. And so the Lord helped me to encourage her there before the casket of her grandfather by marriage. And she looked at me that day with, a, with eyes that were so hungry. And yet with, with, a, with a lostness, uh, without any hope, without any possibility of ever, ever doing God's will again, of ever knowing, ever knowing the Lord Jesus Christ in her life again, I saw it in her eyes. It, it was there. There was, such, there was such a loneliness within her heart, within her soul. But God helped me to convince her. God helped me through Jesus, through God, to convince her that Jesus cared, that he loved her, that, that there was hope for her. And if she didn't have hope for herself, I had hope for her and I had faith. I believe if she would believe the report, I had faith that would heal and help and deliver her from these terrible circumstances. Yes. 
I gave her the three points, and you know, she followed three on those, three on those three points, and the Lord saved her and changed her life. Amen. After five years of living in deep, dark drugs, a drug culture. No one, no one here knows where she's been. There's a few of her that know a few things. Jim would know a few things, but Jim doesn't really know where Betty's been. But Jesus knows. And Jesus cares. And through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit, the Lord brought her back. There's one thing about Betty. She does have an honest heart. She's like the Queen of Sheba. She opened her heart. She listened. And God gave her the solution, the medicine that could make her well. If you'll be honest, the Lord will come to you. You do not receive because when you ask, you ask and with wrong motives that you may spend it on your own pleasures, according to the book of James. Asking is crying, demanding, beseeching, supplicating, weeping. Who is asked? I want to tell you, we ask not until we reach the point of sacrifice. It's when the heart's in agony that it prays. At other times, it, it mutters to itself. Well, what we want then is, is heart to heart communication. Rather, we've got to mean business with God. The great questions of the heart are the great questions that we have in this life happen to be in the heart, they happen to be in here. You see, the issues of this life are in the heart. Solomon said that. The great issues are in the heart of man. It's not mental assent. It's not, it's not because you can't, you can't uh, believe in your mind. The, the great issue is in the heart. Yes, it's right in here. It's rebellion against God or it's an honest heart. The great issues flow out of the heart, come out of the heart, out of the soul of a man. She communed with him of all that was within her heart. Verse 7, I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Thus, God concealeth matters. God's word says it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. Sometimes we don't know things because it's the glory of God to conceal a thing or reveal them little by little as we're able to hear them. It's in his own method and it's suited to the, it's suited to the naked eye. Faith would be generated. If only we could see the universe as God really made it or how God has blessed man or how God has helped man with riches and abundance and wonderful things. If only we could see, if only our eyes could be open, but it's there, it's there to see with the naked eye. How in the world could we ever miss it? With the way the universe has been created, with the way that things are in order, oh, if only we stop and realize there's the reason why the man will know why Haley's common. It's going to come around again someday. In so many years. That's why. It's because of the ordered universe then there's got to be a mastermind behind it. It would be foolish to think that these things just happened that way. There's order in God's universe. But if we simply believe what we say, we just simply believe the report. Jesus said, heal people, you don't need... They walk around. They were cripples. They couldn't. They, they couldn't do anything. They, they couldn't. They couldn't move. They, 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 they were. They were invalids. Many of them were invalids. Yes. But the Lord would reach down and touch them. Remember the man around the pool of Bethesda there. He said, "Oh, I've been waiting here for for many years. I've been here for many many years." He said, "There's no man to help me when the waters are troubled." 
Because Jesus came by one day and touched him. Yes. Made him whole. Why? He touched, he touched the woman that had the issue of blood, if you remember. She was healed, made whole. He touched the hem of his garment. He passed by one day. The lady reached out in faith and touched the hem of his garment. She was made whole. Person after person after person spit on the ground. Remember, put it on a man's eyes and he could see. Now, what do you think that should have done to all the people that saw those miracles? Right away, the, man, the, the mind begins to analyze. Now, this, this, this can't be. This can't be. Some kind of trickery. Yes, sir. Some kind of magic. And they say, what happened to you? Well, I don't know what happened. All I know was I once was blind, but now I see. Amen. Praise God. Praise Jesus, the man called Jesus came by and touched me. And I've been released. I've been made whole. Praise God forevermore. I'll tell you, they were happy because God passed by. Jesus was on the scene. Well, I'll tell you, it should have opened every man's eyes. We ought to be able to see with the eyes. I tell you, our face should grow every time we see a man's life changed. And once living in darkness, we were there once dwelling in darkness and brought from awful, awful blackness and brought to marvelous light that we might show forth the praises of him who had called us. Can you imagine a person living in a pig pen most of their days and all of a sudden coming to life and now they're no, living, no longer living there. They're eating around the king's table and having a great time. Now what should that do for all those that are looking on? What should that do for all the family members? What should that do for man or wife, for husband, or son or daughter? Yeah. Right away the man mind begins to analyze and say, well, it's, it's not going to last. It's not real. I've seen this before. Jesus said the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one soul. Amen. And he said, if you don't cry out, I'll have the stones too. Yes. And mouth and, and praise comes out of the mouth of babes. Yes, and here we in the church were so hardened to certain things. God works, God anoints, God blesses. And we're so hardened to these things that we sit mute and dumb and we look on with analyzation and criticism and find fault when a young one comes home and a lamb is born into the kingdom of heaven. And I'll tell you, we ought to be rejoicing and praising God with everyone that gets any kind of help spiritually or physically from God or anywhere else. If it comes, it's from God, spiritual or physical. Regardless if it comes through doctors or medicine. Or, we need to rejoice. Man. Say, thank God. Praise God. Thank God. If only we could see. But man's had trouble reading things. We've neglected our own salvation. And when we knew God, we didn't glorify Him as God. And God's left many to the, their own reprobate mind to do their own thing and to live in darkness and think they're right. You see God work, rejoice. Yes. You view the universe of God and you see the hand of God. Rejoice. You give him praise and honor and glory. But today, man winds up glorifying the creature rather than the creator. God wants us to glorify the creator of the universe. Amen. Oh, I believe faith would be generated if we could just see the universe and see what God has done and see how God is blessed. Verse 7, Behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity far exceedeth the, re exceedeth the report I heard. <laughs> Reality exceeds expectation in the kingdom of God. Brother, this is greater than anything I've ever known. This is greater than anything I've ever seen. This is greater than anything I ever expected. Yes, sir. I didn't know it was going to be so great myself. Amen. 
I kind of went into it. I, I went into it because Jesus drew me by love and got me into the kingdom of God. But, but I'll tell you, what I found is far greater than anything I ever expected. I have a little more heaven than I ever thought that I'd ever have. I have more joy than I ever thought I'd ever have in this life. I didn't know it could be so good. I didn't know that, that this thing could be so wonderful. It didn't come through seeking, seeking power and seeking gifts. It came by dying and taking the cross and following after Jesus Christ and hearing his voice and doing his will. Oh, I found the pearl of great price, which is Christ, my Lord, and being centered in his kingdom and walking with him. I didn't know it could be like heaven. I didn't know it could be so full of joy. I didn't know it could be so great. Praise God for evermore. Ruth Ann said, I didn't know death could be so wonderful. I didn't know to die to myself and take a cross and follow Jesus could be so marvelous. Praise God. You see, we're not happy. Unless my man's dying to himself, he's not happy. The apostle Paul met Jesus. He, 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 he was happy for a while. But I'll tell you, after a while, he, he hit a crossroads. He hit a crossroads. He said, man, there's an inward law warring against the, the law of the Spirit. He said, there's a, there's a law of the flesh. It wars against the law of the Spirit. He, he, he was wondering, oh God, can I ever get over this thing? Can I get through this thing? What in the world? He said, when I want to do good, I can't. When I desire to do right, I, I cannot obey God. I, I want to, I desire to, I long to get after God. But he said, I want to, but there's a law in here that wars against it. Oh Lord, oh anyone, is there anyone can help me? And the scripture tells us, God can there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life and Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Then my help is in God. My help is in death and dying and doing God's will. I mean to self. I don't mean to you going out here and you know kill on myself. I mean to this thing in here, this carnal nature that I've been born with. There's where the joy is. There's where the life is. There's where heaven is. As my hairdresser said, well, why do I... I love Jesus. I love my family. Why do I criticize? Why do I find fault with them? Why does this thing come up in me? She said, I get this thing in me and I, I want to say the last word. Every time I get in an argument, I want to say the last word. She said, and I'll tell you, I get very unhappy about that. What, what's wrong with me? Well, I was privileged to tell her that day. She's like the Queen of Sheba coming and asking me. She said, is there anything you can help me with? Can you tell me? Because Jesus led me to her over in Blacksburg. I found her over in Blacksburg. In a little shop over there one day. As we prayed and prayed and waited upon God. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I said, Jesus, you've got to help me to find the right place. And one day, located the right place. Got rid of the right person, which led me to the other person, which has led me to several people. Amen. Reality in the kingdom of God exceeds all expectation. Yes, I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Oh, the riches of His grace. Oh, the wealth and the kingdom of God. But we see that the Queen of Sheba could not limit her commendation and ecstasy to the king himself. She said in verse 8, How happy your men must be. Oh, how happy! Oh, how happy your men must be. Amen. Happy are thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Oh, happy, happy, happy heart. Oh, what joy they must have. Oh, how great, what a great assignment to stand before the king continually. Stand with him. Stay with him. Amen. Listen to him. Amen. Oh, to be a servant of King Solomon. 
Oh, to be a servant of God. Oh, to be permitted sometimes to overhear a conversation of a man of God, to catch even a stray word now and then. Happy are these thy servants. Can you imagine something so wonderful and glorious as to catch one little cloud crumb that might fall from the master's table? That's all I mean. Just, just get one little crumb that might, might fall down. Just, oh, to taste of the morsel. Oh, to have heaven within. Oh, how marvelous. I mean, to overhear, to overhear. Oh, words of wisdom, words of light, words of truth. Wonderful words, heavenly words, powerful words, filled with grace and glory and truth. That'll, that'll be so truthful. That'll get right to the quick and right to the heart of it. Oh, she looked at salt. She had prayed. She had cried. I guarantee you, my friend, she had cried. She had waited before God. She had cried, oh God, is there someone on this earth can help me? Is there someone that will be truthful with me? Is there someone can give me word from God? Sometimes the servants are standing around listening when it doesn't seem like they're listening at all. Oh, they must, they must have been serving him diligently with both hands and, and having such a submissive heart, knowing the greatness of the man. Dr. Alvin True Blood said the next best thing to being great is to walk with the great. Yes. That's what he said. Yes, oh, he's a great man. Dr. True Blood's a great man. Yes. Oh, such a great mind. Oh, such a great heart for God. Such a longing so after God. Such wonderful words of wisdom. But you know, you wouldn't know Dr. True Blood if you didn't stay close to him because he's real quiet. He's real quiet. He may, he may not barge into a room and tell you what he thinks or tell you what's on his heart. He may be in a room and he's quiet as all the rest. Or quieter. I found that God's men are quiet men. I've been on trips with Robert Morgan when he'd sit and listen and wouldn't say hardly a word until he was asked. I said, Brother Morgan... Do you have any light on the scripture? Is there anything you can tell us about this? You know, he doesn't really claim to know much. But I found that generally he can give you a wonderful answer that will enlighten your mind, your heart. It may be from some man of God he read, or it may be from something God just revealed to him, or, or it could be just a sharing from uh, some sermon that he heard or whatever. But I'll tell you, he, he'll relay to you the information that may set the soul free. Oh, to walk with the great. Dr. Trueblood said, it's the next best thing to being great yourself is to walk with a man that's great. But do we know greatness when it appears? They didn't know Jesus. A servant to God's anointed has a heaven of his own. He's in a land that hardly anybody else is in. We'd be happier if we knew our privileges more. But we don't know that we're privileged people. We don't know that God's anointed. We don't know that God's ordained. We don't know that God sent. We don't know that God has called. We don't know that God has His hand upon man today. We don't know that and we don't seem to know where to find Him. But we'd be far happier if we knew our privileges more. What's well, a sad thing to think that we've outgrown our teachers and have no further need of their assistance. So the teachers can do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. Just like Jesus, the lowliest in the church today can be a greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because of his privileges in Jesus Christ. Say, what can he be? I'll tell you what he can be. He can be a servant of the Most High God. He can be a servant of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He can be a servant to mankind. He can love everybody. What are his privileges? He has a privilege called prayer. Of waiting before God day and night. 
The book of Isaiah tries to, tried to teach us. Isaiah tried to teach us. Wait before him. Don't, don't give him any rest day or night. Don't give him any rest. As one translation says, don't give yourself any rest and give him no rest. Day nor night. Oh, the privilege. Oh, the great privilege we have of prayer. Of lifting the hands of those that need prayer. Of helping those saints. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there too. For all oh, saints. Saints need more prayer than anyone. Because the devil's out to destroy them. We'd be far happier people if we knew our privileges. If we knew we had a privilege of hearing a man of God someday. Oh, if we knew. We'd be far happier. It's a privilege, you know, to hear some men preach. It's a privilege to hear some men pray. It's a privilege to see some men really obey God. Well, the time will come when we shall know that a prophet has been among us. But do we recognize that God has ordained? Do we recognize, as the Queen of Sheba did, that it's in our day and not Moses? Do we recognize that it's, the time is now? For that's one of the greatest things that happened to Queen Sheba. She knew now. And she responded now. She didn't have to read it in a history book. She responded now. God revealed to her there was a man over there. Praise God. She responded now. She sought him out now. She, she sat at his feet now. She listened now. She hungered now. She got the answers. Now. But what did Jesus make of this incident? He did talk about it, you know. He did mention this. Do you remember the scriptures? Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. The queen of south of the south, speaking about the queen of Sheba, will rise at the judgment with, their, with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than a Solomon is here. Said she came from the ends of the earth. She made herself uncomfortable. She troubled herself. She came from the ends of the earth. Because the queen of Sheba did that. You're going to be under judgment someday, Jesus says. She's going to rise up. The queen of Sheba is going to rise up. She's going to tell of how she received help, of how God came, of how God gave her wisdom and knowledge and revelation, how God taught her, how God spoke to her heart that day. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. She came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon. Brother, I'll tell you what she's going to say. You didn't try hard enough. You didn't work long enough. You didn't pray through. You didn't work at the saying of seeking first the kingdom of God. From the days of John the Baptist and now the kingdom of heaven is preached and every man presseth into it. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. You didn't work hard enough at this thing. She's going to rise up and condemn you because she troubled herself. A greater than a Solomon is here. See, what's that mean? <laughs> you know what it means. He answers greater questions. He distributes greater blessings. He reigns in a more glorious state. He's a greater person. Jesus Christ. And when he sees Solomon in all of his grandeur, when he beholds this great Solomon, he takes up off the grass one little blade. Just one, that's all. Just, just one little blade of grass. He plucks the flower from the field. He said, even Solomon... In all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. 
There it is for the eyes to behold. Anointed eyes will have an anointed response. And that man, that man would know that he would never be poor again. And he would never be alone again. Why? I'll tell you why. For a greater than Solomon is here. His name is Jesus. He's there for you. He's there for me. Shall we stand, please? Oh, Father, we thank you. Pray that this this message be anointed to our hearts. It ought to encourage us to get closer, to draw nigh. The Scripture plainly teaches that if we'll resist the devil, he will draw nigh unto you. Or he will flee from you. If we draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. It should give us hope. Pray, Lord, we'll know more about our privileges. I pray our eyes will be opened. Pray, Lord, would see as we've never seen before, would hear like we've like we've never heard before. We've missed so much. We pray, Lord, that the truth, as we've heard it, will be applied to our lives and set us free. For Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Thank you for the word of God today. It's scripture. It's recorded for us. Pray, Lord, you'd help us to hear it in our hearts and respond accordingly. Christ's name we pray. Amen.